So we're in Mark chapter 8, and I wanted to ask you guys a question. Gentlemen, gentlemen, there's no reason for you to be talking to each other right now. Okay? Luke, do you have a Bible? Okay, then you guys need to pay attention now. Ladies? Okay. Mark 8 is going to talk about something that's uh, familiar to us, probably. Last time in Mark 6, Jesus got a bunch of people together a few chapters ago. Luke, turn around. You don't need to look out there. Okay, Jesus, I'm going to write a number on the board. You tell me what Jesus did. Anybody remember this? He fed the 5,000. Jesus, yeah, fed the 5,000. Okay. Ezra? My Bible says 4,000. Well, you're in, I asked about Mark 6, but you're right. At Mark 8, Jesus fed how many? 5,000. No? 4,000. 4,000. Now, here's kind of the strange thing that we have to think about here. Mark is a shorter gospel. It's, it's pretty compressed. It's shorter than the, the rest of the gospels. Um, and it's, it's pretty strategic. About It didn't include all the information about Jesus, but it included some things that Mark thought, and Peter, who was talking to Mark, uh, that they thought, okay, these are the most important things for including in this particular gospel, okay, of Jesus' life. But why did they include stories that seemed pretty similar? Two narratives about Jesus of something that he did, two miracles that he did. One's feeding the 5,000, one's feeding the 4,000. So it's, why, why would they include that information? Why couldn't you just, you know, skip one of these? So how would you figure out which one is, you know, uh, why he did this, why the author did this? What's a strategy we could use to figure that out, maybe? This helps us understand, you know, when we're reading the Bible. What's that? Context clues? Yeah, context clues, for sure, that's true. Uh, and what do you mean by that? That's a good point. Like, um, <coughs> bless you. Like, if you fed the 5,000, okay. you could, um, okay. in the context clues, it might say, like, why he fed the 5,000, and then why he went and fed the 4,000, like, the explanation behind it. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, the word why Jesus did each of these different things. That might be uh, key from what's going on. That's great. Yeah, so he has different purposes, different intentions for why he does both of these things. Okay, so that's a good point. And, and Mark focuses on them because they both have something important to say, so they didn't feel like he could skip one of them. Okay, so we, we do what uh, you may have heard in like school or something like this. What you would do is you try to compare and contrast, okay? What's the same and what's different, okay? That's what we're going to look at. And what we're going to see, hang on a second, Alice, is that this one's focused more towards Israel, okay? Now this, and the Jews, the people of God, that were God's unique chosen people, okay? And talking about the, you know, the salvation that was going to come from them. This one, even though it's, it's Israel still involved there, you have more of a focus of what Jesus is going to do toward the Gentiles, meaning, as Kenton explained last time, people who are not Jews, people who are outside of the, the nation of Israel, but who God is going to extend salvation to them as well. And we saw this with uh, people who approached Jesus and asked them to heal, uh, heal them or heal someone else, and Jesus you know, uh, said he was there to focus on Israel for that time, but often he would uh, heal them. Okay, so we're going to get into Mark 8. Read, uh, Ellie, you had a question or a comment? Um, <clears throat> does that say Isaiah 64 through 9 or 60 49? Yeah, that's a good question. Isaiah 60, when it does this with the, the comma, 4, comma, 9, what's that? What's being said there is I'm looking at Isaiah 60, verse 4, and Isaiah 60, verse 9. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Good thing to know when you're looking at like a list of uh, Bible verses. Okay, let me read, uh, and you can read along with me or listen as I read. Uh, Mark 8, 1 through 3. It says, In those days there was again a large crowd, and they had nothing to eat. Jesus called his disciples to them and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some have come from a great distance. Okay, so now Jesus is saying again, okay, all these people are with me, we're in a distant place, and 
they have nothing to eat. And it's kind of similar. Now, remember that the disciples had seen Jesus feed the 5,000, okay? So, but still, they're not going to see, they're still going to be like, oh, what's the, there's a problem, we're out of food. But why is it kind of not smart for them to, to say, well, this is a big problem. We can't feed all these 4,000 people. Because what happened earlier? Yeah, Ellie? Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's not good to say that because earlier on, like, earlier before that, he fed 4,000 Gentiles, and you should not doubt the power of God. Yeah, or he fed the 5,000 earlier. But yeah, but yeah sorry, exactly. Yeah, he fed them. So they already know that Jesus can do this. So this shouldn't be a problem. But they are still not really getting who Jesus is. And notice that the focus here... In the 5,000, Jesus was focused more on teaching the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. This time he's focused more about like feeding the people because they're hungry, they've been with him for three days, and it's a great distance. Uh, who wants to read? Okay, uh, let's start with uh, Juliana. Juliana, can you read Isaiah 43, 19 and 20? And then Ellie, do you want to read as well? Can you read Isaiah 60, verse 4 through 9? Okay, and while you ladies are four and nine, and while you ladies are looking that up, let me explain. Isaiah is in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus, and he's looking ahead to what God is going to do in the future, that God is going to bring salvation, okay, to Israel, and then also uh, that he was going to bring salvation to the world as well. But I want you to listen for some of the, the language here. So, Remember, in Mark 8, 3, it says a lot of these people had come from a great distance, okay? So this is uh, picking up on something from Isaiah. So, Juliana, can you read Isaiah 43, 19, and 20? See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, and, or honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Give drink to my people, my children. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So Isaiah 43, where did it, it said God is going to do something new. Okay, this is talking about God's renewal or the bringing of uh, hope or the gospel or salvation. Okay, but he says he was going to do this in where? What kind of location? Yeah. The wilderness. Is that you guys heard that same thing too? The wasteland. The wasteland, the wilderness. And so that's what Mark is kind of picking up on is okay, Jesus is going to do this miracle in a great distance in the wilderness, and it's going to start to represent that this salvation that Isaiah was talking about, that Jesus is going to do that. Okay. Uh, Ellie, are you ready with yours? Okay, so can you read us verse four and verse nine? Okay. Look up, look all around you. All your people are getting together to come back to you. Your sons will come from far away. Your daughters will be carried on the hip like little children. People from the islands are coming to you. The, the, ship, the ships of Tarshish are out in front. Uh, <clears throat> they are bringing your children back from far away. Your children are being, bringing their silver and gold with them. They're, they are coming to honor me. I am the Lord your God. I am the Holy One of Israel. I have honored you. Okay, thank you. So it said that they were bringing the people, or the Gentiles were going to come to God from close or from far? Far. Far away. Yeah, so that's what Mark is picking up on here. He talks about Jesus doing something in the wilderness and people coming from a great distance. So Jesus feeds them, feeds the 4,000 again. Instead, this time... Uh, there's no fish, it's just, just loaves of bread. And so he feeds them, showing that he's going to bring that salvation uh, that's coming by doing this sign. Okay. Now we're going to move on and look at Jesus' enemies, Okay, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the Jews during this time. And then, uh, so Jesus has just done this miracle. What are some other miracles that Jesus has done that we've read in Mark specifically? Yeah. Blake? Um, he made a deaf man hear and a um, um, person that can't speak, speak. Okay. Great points. Yep. So he made a deaf man hear and a, a, a person who cannot speak, someone who's mute. 
able to speak. So hold on to the deaf man when we come back to that in a few minutes, okay? Because so, that's going to be important later. Uh, okay, so great. What else did Jesus do? Other types of miracles. Yeah? He walked on water. Okay, he's walked on water. Okay. Uh, Samuel? Turned water into wine. Turned water into wine? Yeah, yeah that's in John, but, that, but that's true. He has done that by this point. That's one of his, uh, that's identified as his first miracle. Okay. Any other things in Mark? Yeah. Okay. He's done a bunch of things. He cast out demons, all this type of stuff. But, well, yeah, he cast out demons and the pigs, right? Now, you would think this would be enough for people to believe in Jesus, right? And it is. Jesus is already showing that he's from God. Okay. He's already demonstrated and proven that he's God's son, right? That he's uniquely uh, sent from God. Okay, let's focus up here. Okay, gentlemen, let's focus up here. Same thing. But, do people who don't want to believe in God or believe in Jesus, do they ever accept evidence? Do they ever accept proof? If, if you said, hey, uh, I'll give you a bunch of evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, but the person doesn't want to believe in Jesus because they don't want to follow Jesus, they don't want to obey Jesus, uh, can you ever give them enough evidence? No. They're not going to believe because they don't want to believe, because they don't want to uh, honor and obey God, right? Not because the evidence isn't there, but because they don't, uh, they don't want to follow God. Okay, so let me read Mark uh, 8, 11 through 13. Listen to how the, what the Pharisees ask Jesus for, or what they ask him to do. It says, The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him or, to, or testing him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. Okay, so what did the Pharisees ask Jesus for? Yeah, Ellie? A sign from heaven. Okay, what's exactly? And what does a sign from heaven mean? What's it indicating there? Yeah. Maybe like an angel or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, it could be lots of things, but a work of power in order to show that he was who he said he was, right? Now, Jesus has already done a bunch of these works of power, okay? And he could have done more, probably, right? So they're testing him, but Jesus does not do it. And he says, there won't be any signs for this generation, and why does he say that? Why, if you, you know, had been in that position and you could do a miracle, someone wasn't going to believe what you were doing, but you could do a miracle, we might have done it. Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do it. Why, why did Jesus uh, do a miracle to try to prove who he was? What do you guys think? Tilly? Um. Okay, that's fine. If you remember, you can... Because if he did, then they would have believed him, and they wouldn't have killed him, and he would never have died. Well, possibly. I, I, don't, I don't think so. But we'll, th that, you may think, okay, Jesus does one more miracle, then they wouldn't have killed him, right? Or they would have believed in him. But I don't think so, and we'll, we'll see why. Yeah, what do you I, think? Um, they not have thought that the devil was like, telling him to do it. Okay, they, they, yeah, because remember when Jesus did signs before, they said, well, those signs come from the devil, right? So it doesn't matter what he does. They're going to find some way not to believe. Yeah? <clears throat> Maybe um, uh, he doesn't have to prove he's God because he is God, well, Jesus. So they should just know that he is God so he doesn't have to prove. Yeah, G they're testing Jesus. They're not, they're not looking for more information. Jesus could give them information, or Jesus can give them signs. We've already said Jesus has healed people. He's healed blind people. He's cast out demons, all this stuff. That was not enough for them because they don't want to believe. And this is similar to, so the Pharisees have unbelief in Jesus that causes them to test Jesus, right? Jesus says this is basically like Israel did the same thing to God in the Old Testament. Even though God had done these signs, he'd brought them out of Egypt, he'd done all these miracles, Israel still didn't believe in God either. And they tested God as well. Okay? 
And so they did the same thing. Um, in the Old Testament, so the word generation there, Jesus says, I'm not going to give a sign to this generation because you're just like the old generation. You're just like the people who didn't believe God in the past. He said, so it's, I'm not going to try to prove something to people who uh, don't want to believe. That's what he's basically saying. So when people don't believe in God, it's they, they're going to always ask for more proof. They're always going to ask for more evidence. Um, but the thing is, they won't believe even if you give them enough evidence, right? Um, Luke 16, Jesus talks about, they already have the Old Testament. They already have Moses. They already have the prophets. They wouldn't even believe in Jesus if somebody came back from the dead. If, if the Bible is not good enough for them, then they wouldn't believe it even if somebody came back from the dead, right? Even though Jesus came back from the dead, does everybody believe in Jesus? Mm. Every single person on earth? No, no. No, I mean, I'm sure maybe everybody here, that's possible, but you, you see what I'm saying. Not everybody even believed in Jesus after he rose from the dead, right? So that it wasn't that there was a, enough for them. It was that they weren't coming uh, under the authority of what God has said. Okay, uh, we're going to move ahead, okay? Verses 14 through 21, they get back into the boat. Jesus is warning them, not <coughs> warning the disciples not to be like the Pharisees. And then he, uh, he starts talking about bread, and he starts talking about what's called leaven. Leaven is something that you put into bread that makes it rise, like we would call it today, like yeast, okay? And Jesus is using leaven as like a metaphor. He's saying leaven is like sin. And so he says, you know, watch out for these guys. But they think he's talking about a loaf of bread. They, he's, they think he's literally talking about this loaf of bed, bread in the boat. And Jesus is talking about someone else. Have you ever told a joke or said something where someone missed the point? That's what, yes, this yeah. is what's going on with Jesus. He's talking about something serious. He's talking about the Pharisees. And he's saying it's like leaven and bread. That's how their sin is. And they're like, well, we got a little bit of bread over here in the boat. You know, like, so th they're missing the point. And Jesus says to them, uh, do you really think I'm talking to you about bread? He says that in uh, Mark 8, 17 and 18, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? He says, do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? And he says, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? So basically, they can hear, they can see, but they're not getting the point, right? That's what Mark is showing us about the disciples, is that they, they love Jesus, they as far as they understand, believe in Jesus, but they keep missing the point, right? Um, Blake brought up that Je but Jesus was able to do what? Was it a miracle I told you to remember? Um, he, healed a, he healed a deaf man and a person that can't speak. Yeah, or the so, so he healed, I'm going to focus in on the deaf man. So even though Jesus says, you're not hearing, you're not getting what I'm saying, you're not hearing me, Jesus is able to undo you know, even like physical deafness. Later on, he even heals uh, a blind man in Mark 8, 22 through 26. So Jesus is able to take away that blindness, right? So some, and that's what Jesus is going to focus on as well, that people's blindness isn't just with their eyes, it's their blindness comes from where? In their hearts, hearts souls, yeah. That it's a, it's a spiritual blindness. But Jesus is able to undo that as well. Okay. Uh, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, it said that God's servant would come and that he would open the eyes of the blind, which Jesus does physically, but he also does uh, spiritually as well. The center of the book of Mark, as we finish up here, the time we uh, go until... Okay, got some time. Okay. Uh, the center of the book of Mark is actually the words of Peter. Okay, so Peter, now a lot of different sources outside the Bible tell us that Mark sat down, Mark was writing this out, and the Holy Spirit was guiding him as he was doing this, but that it says uh, that he was sitting down with Peter and getting Peter's information about the gospel. So Peter and Mark are probably working together on this project of putting together the gospel of Mark. So the middle kind of part of the book is what Peter says, which is true about Jesus, even though he doesn't totally uh, get it either. Okay, let me read Mark eight twenty seven through 29. Okay, 
So listen along here. It says, Jesus went out along uh, with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questions, questions his disciples, uh, who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, but who do you say that I am? Okay, so Jesus said, okay, who do people say I am? And there are a lot of wrong answers. Some people think that he's Elijah, an ancient prophet risen from the dead. Some people think he's John the Baptist, a recent prophet risen from the dead. Some people think he's some guy from the past who's somehow come back. So they have all these wrong answers about Jesus. It's kind of recognizing his power and his teaching and his miracles, but they, they're not getting it. And so Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Okay, so they have to be confronted to, to say, okay, do you recognize, do you have faith in who Jesus is? And uh, how does Peter answer? You guys know this one? Uh, yeah, Blake? Um, he answered, you are the Christ. Yeah, so he, he gets it right. He says, you are the Christ. He understands Jesus is uh, the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the son of God, as Mark talks about in the beginning and is going to continue to talk about through the rest of the book. But even Peter doesn't totally get this yet. Oh, and Jesus also warns them to not tell anyone. So Mark focuses in right on the time of Jesus' ministry that Jesus is keeping a lot of this stuff secret, that it's, it's called what's like an open secret. It's something that's hidden that's going to eventually come out, okay? So he confesses that Jesus is the Christ, and then Jesus makes, talks about what's the big coming event for Jesus in the Gospels? Uh, Juliana. Yeah, his crucifixion. Now, G Peter knew that Jesus was a Christ, but he did not think that meant that Jesus was going to die, especially get crucified. Uh, listen to Mark 8.31. It says, And he began to teach them, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the, uh, the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So Jesus started to look ahead and say, okay, I as the Son of Man am going to be rejected by everyone and then I'm going to be crucified and die and then three days later I'm going to rise from the dead. The disciples at that, we accept that because that's you know what we know 2,000 years later, but the disciples couldn't grasp the idea that the, the, the Messiah was going to die. And so they didn't understand why this had to uh, be the case. And Peter actually tries to say to Jesus, Lord, this is never going to happen. Right? You can't, that, that's not going to happen. We're, we're not going to let you get killed. Um, yeah, and then what? I feel happens? like that's disrespecting the Lord because yeah. he knows what's going to happen because. Um, he's, well, Jesus, so I feel like that's kind of disrespecting the Lord because they're telling him that, no, that isn't going to happen. We are not going to let you die. So I just, yeah. if it, he knows it is going to happen. So. Yep. So they're missing the point. That's, that's exactly right. So they keep missing the point. And Jesus even corrects Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. He says, basically, you're speaking like the devil. You're trying to keep me away from what God wants me to. To do, And I'm telling you very plainly, I need to suffer, be crucified, and rise again three days later. Now the disciples eventually get this, but they don't really fully get it until it happens later on. Mark, it writes in such a way that we get it. We're seeing what's going on here in the story, and we're, we're like, okay, we understand. But he, that's why he makes the disciples look kind of dumb. He makes them look like they didn't get it at the time, which they didn't. But we're supposed to understand what's going on here. Uh, let me finish up with this, the last couple of verses here. Jesus teaches them about being a disciple. He says, and he summoned the crowd and his disciples with them. It says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Meaning, be prepared to die, give up your life to follow Jesus. He says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man gain in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me in my words, uh, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of, the, uh, of his Father and the holy angels. So Jesus says, okay, it's give up your life, take up the cross, and follow him. That's what Jesus calls it to, meaning you have to give up 
serving self and sin and follow Jesus instead. And it doesn't matter if you gain the whole world, you have everything in this world, and then you lose your soul, you lose your eternity. Uh, Now, Jesus does this, but does Jesus just say, this is something for my followers to do, but not for me? No, Jesus is in Mark is the perfect example of this. That he doesn't uh, save he doesn't save his life. Remember when he's on the cross later, they're going to say, "Why don't you save yourself?" But Jesus said this here. No, no, no. It's not about saving my life. It's going to be about losing his life so that he can uh, be that example of discipleship and also that he can uh, save his people. Okay, so we're going to end there. That's Mark chapter eight. Okay, long chapter, a lot going on there. You can read more if you're uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, but let's uh, close in a word of prayer. Okay. Gentlemen. Lord God, we thank you for this uh, example of Jesus. We thank you for his teaching. We thank you for your word that gives us uh, clarity on who Jesus is. And we pray that because of that, that you will uh, cause us to uh, desire to come after him, to follow him, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. That we wouldn't try to save our lives in this world, but that we'd give it up so that we can uh, save our lives in the sense of uh, having our life uh, defined by Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.